All right, guys, here's another episode of the Daily CDs. I'd like to take this time to thank all the people who've joined my Patreon. I really appreciate that. And also the guys who have joined uh, my membership on my YouTube channel. Uh, all that really helps a lot. And also to uh, Value Pack, dog food. You know, I fed Value Pack before. I really thought it was good dog food. The hounds did really good on it. And uh, I'll be feeding it again here soon. Uh, I think it's really important that we support the companies that support what we do. Also to W Supply. Uh, they provide this platform for us to share our content. And uh, I want to thank them for that. Anyway, here's that episode. Enjoy. Well, I'll thank you for this happening around probably 63, 64, somewhere in that area, in that length, of, in close to there anyway. Now, this is about a bear hunt, and this is about one real, honest-to-goodness, mean bear. That bear had been in that country up there for years, and he made the biggest track that is in that whole country, and lots of people could tell his tracks when they seen it. And he had been killing off it, off and on in there for a lot of years. And he had been run by a lot of different packs of dogs and had never been killed. And we had run him quite a few times when we had guests with us. And you just couldn't hold that bar to get a guest up to him. Because if you're trying to get up to him, he knew, knew that people was a father in those dogs and he'd either smell you or hear you or something, and he'd get out of there, and no matter if you had real fighting dogs, they just couldn't hold him for any length of time. And so I told Clell then, I said, Clell, we'd run him one fall there, that same fall. I said, I never want to run that bar again, long as I've got guests and trying to get somebody up there to kill him. I said, if I ever run that bar again, I want to go and if I can kill him, kill him myself or anybody in, in the group. And I don't want to have no clients there. So we had finished our season up there in those, in the White Mountains there, close to where Clay lived, and uh, guiding bear hunters and had had good luck. And then we guided some elk hunters and a few deer hunters. And that was getting long up in November. As I, I remember it is right around the 20th of November. And I was getting ready to move back to Tucson and get everything prepared to go into Mexico after Jaguars for clients. And so Her, Herschel Downs, the next rancher, uh, lived on the next ranch down there that was a real good friend of ours. And uh, we had caught quite a few predatory animals for him and he was a friend that would, if you needed help, he'd sure help you. So he came up to the Clell's ranch there and said, listen, he said, I know where that old bear is, and I think he's staying in there close, and there's a lots of acorns in there, and I found where he's been going through a little saddle in uh, K.P. Creek, just w what it was was a point running off the ridge, and made a deep saddle. And he said, that bear's been going back and forth through that saddle, and there's all kinds of bear droppings there and lots of sign, from some of it pretty old and a lot of it fresh. And he said, I think that that bear's getting ready to hibernate right around in there close somewhere. And he said, I'd sure love to kill that bear and get him out of this country because says he's been in here for quite a few years, and he has killed lots of stock for different ranchers there, and, uh, and Clell and Herschel was included in those ranchers that he'd been a killing on. So we decided we would make a, a big trip down in there with fully intentions of killing that bear, and anybody in the group that got a chance would kill him. So that evening, Sammy Foster, came in there, and he was on his honeymoon, his wife with him. And he's a boy that had 
had been hunting with Clell and I for years, and he had uh, at one time worked for Clell for eight years. He come by with a pack horse and on, and a and a riding one and a packing one. He'd made a circle up through New Mexico and would stop and work at different ranchers. And he'd been gone from that country he was from down there for several months. And he came by just to visit Clell and was going on back down in the, around the Sierra Vista and down in there where he is from. And when he stopped there then, well, Clell gave him a job and he worked for him for eight years. But anyway, he came in there. And of course, he loved to hunt. And he's really, he's still a hunting. And he's really more of a, a bear hunter than he is a lion hunter, although he's hunted lots of them both. And he is also a guide now. Oh, he was excited and said, I sure want to go with you. And he wanted to take his wife with him. And so I told Clell, I said, Clell, that is a mistake. He said, what are you talking about? I said, Sammy are going with us and taking his wife. I said, because now he won't leave that gal and go to those dogs a foot or anything and leave his wife because he just won't do it. And I said, that's probably to be necessary when we get after this big old mean bear. Well, Clell says, well, listen, I can't hardly tell him that he can't let his wife go and now on his honeymoon. He said, I just can't tell him that. I said, all right, let him take her. But I said, I'll tell you, brother, that's a mistake. And I know it is. He said, well, it may be, but says, I can't do anything about it. So we formed a plan of attack, you'd call it, on that bear. Now, this was a big, rugged, bluffy canyon that he was uh, making sign in. And it was, that was K.P. Creek that runs out of the White Mountains and then the Blue River. And Herschel Downs lived right down close to the river, probably not over a three-quarters of a mile from the river, if that far. Maybe not over a half a mile to where K.P. runs into the blue. <clears throat> and anyway, real early the next morning, well, we were down there with our hounds, and I believe that we had, we had 10 or 12 dog hounds. And we had two half bulldog and half hounds that belonged to Clell, and they were good bear dogs, and one of them was a good cold trailer and a good lion dog that was a male. Then he had a female there that didn't run anything but a fresh track, but she was a better bear dog and would fight one harder than the male. So we took them, and I think we took 10 or 12 dogs. I took several, and Clell took several. So the way we done it, Herschel and Sammy and Gail, his wife, went up one side of the of KP on the high rim, and Clell and I went up a trail on the other side. And so when we got up on the trail and looked off to that little peak down there that made that saddle, well, the idea was Clell was going to go off in there and start the hounds, and I was going to stay up on that high trail and try to follow which way the dogs went. So he, when he started off in there, why, well, my hounds wouldn't go with him. They stayed with me. But he dropped off in there anyway, and we knew good and well if his dogs went hit a, uh, hit that track down there and Clell let them go, well, we knew that mine had built them just fast as they could, and it wouldn't take them no length of time to be there. So as luck would have it, sure enough, that bear just went through that saddle out in a real fresh trail, and just as soon as he hit that little saddle, right down from that little peak, well, what I mean, they hit it, and they went to bawling and squalling, and they left there, and, of course, my hounds just piled off in there to them, and I think I had five or six, and he had five or six. And away they went. Well, they rimmed around in another canyon right there by the by that saddle and around it and in the main KP Creek and crossed it out on the other side and started rimming out. Well, they got pretty high on that ridge. 
kind of in some rims and things up there in the bays. And I expected Herschel Downs and Sammy and Gail to be up there to where they could hear them and go to them. And they were bayed in there for a long time. And I finally went around and got out on a point that was real bluffy and dropped off into this main KP. And I decided I'd take off my shaps and spurs and, and tie my mule. I was riding a big old mule that I called Molly that was a, a good mountain animal and a good big mule. And I got off and tied her and took off my shaps and spurs and I got ready to start to try to go to them afoot. But I knew it'd take me a good while because that ridge that they were, rim that they was climbing out on like they was going to go over the top was steep and it was rugged. And I was standing there just before I left old Molly and I heard them go out and rim around like there's a climbing out to the top of that ridge. Well, I decided then that I'd go back and hit a trail that crossed KP up there about a mile farther up and get out and rim on over because I thought he was going over into that next canyon that we call Grapevine. And Herschel Downs was way across there and he saw me and he hollered me and asked me what's happened. I said, well, you fellas ought to already kill that bear. But I said, I think that he's rimming over in the grapevine. So he just running, he's off of his horse, and he just run and jumped on him. And I saw him really pouring it on that horse, going around there. And he could climb back out to that ridge fairly good from there. Take him a while, but it was pretty good going. And But I just kept her, kept her going on old Molly, and I crossed Cape P and rimmed out and was starting in kind of in behind Downs, and all of a sudden I heard those dogs coming right back towards me, and they come around the point, and I hadn't heard them for quite a while, and they were just all a-barking right at that bear, and it wasn't far from me. And I just run out on the point and just piled off of old Molly and Tiger, jerked off my shouts and my spurs, and grabbed my gun, and away I went. Well, just as I got down there, they came in to a kind of a, a little old ring con that was uh, it just kind of formed a, a ring con in there with high high bluffs on the upper side, and there's only one way the bar could go in and out of there. And he had come in from below, and if he was going to go out, he'd have to go out below. Well, the hillside was real steep, and this bluff was high. It was around places 100 feet high. And I had to be real careful trying to get down there and look over or I might slip and fall and go off of that bluff. And I knew if I did, that would be my last go round. So I got down close enough I could look over and I could see the dogs are barking at that bear, but he was so close to the bluff that I couldn't see him. And I saw what was happening, so I decided I'd just circle and get down there to where he'd come in there, and that's where he's going to have to go out, and I figured I'd kill him right there. And, of course, it was real rough going, and I was just a scrambling and going as fast as I could around there. And just as I hit down there, which wasn't too far then, to, to main KP Creek, well, this bar had come out, and I bet I didn't miss him two minutes. And he'd cross KP and going out the other side. Well, instead of going back to my mule then, I just went on after my foot. And got up there, and I found Clell, and... Uh, and some of the dogs was barking tree. Well, that meant that they'd been baying that thing then for several hours. They'd been baiting him right on the ground for around four or five hours by that time. So some of these dogs had stopped. And he'd rubbed up against that tree or maybe climbed up it a little ways, but we couldn't make him climb a tree. And anyway, well, Clell said they haven't got anything. He says, and that about half of them was there, and the other half was after the bar, so we took them and got them on the tracks and away then went after them. And we thought then that he was going to rim out and go into the next canyon over from there that we call Steeple. And Clell was horseback and I was afoot. And I told Clell, I said, will you go on after him and see by golly if you can't kill him? He said, well, I'm going to kill him if I can. So the way he went, and I walked out up there and looked way back across there to where my mule was, and I knew I was going to have to eventually go to it. 
So I went up and hit the same trail that I'd rode Molly over when I went over there. I started walking around that trail right slow and listening. And after a bit, I heard these dogs are coming back. And they were really obeying and coming. And most of them were still in the race. So I run down out on a little point there, and I had that little cur dog that was half shepherd and half cocker, uh, Springer Spaniel, that was quite a bar dog and a great jaguar dog. And that's the first time I'd ever had him whipped out on a bar. And he came to me, and he was whipped out. So I got out, on, and they come and bait him right at the foot of this bluff, which if I looked off of it, and uh, kind of led you, and it was probably 75 feet to the bottom. And I looked down there, and kind of in the brush and all, and dogs all around him was this big old bear. And he was just standing there with his back end kind of towards that bluff, and he just a weave in his head from side to side. And I knew that he had really been a charge in those dogs. So I decided I'd see if I couldn't kill him. And I had a, a, a 35 uh, Marlin that shoots the 35 Remington ammunition. And that's a good gun up close. So I loaded her and got all ready and... and I was a little bit afraid to shoot at his head the way he was uh, throwing it from side to side. So I decided I'd try to shoot him right in the neck, shooting down. So I poked my gun just about right straight down and took a sight and I pulled the trigger. Well, boy, the commotion come off. And when that gun went off, those dogs charged him. Well, I saw him pick up my best hound in his in his uh, teeth and just hit. <laughs> Re reached up with both front feet kind of standing on his hind feet and just tore that dog right out of him and hit the ground and he jumped on him. Well, I couldn't hardly shoot in there with all those dogs in that bar because I was as apt to kill a dog as a bear. And if I, I'd have rather the bear would have killed the dog than I would have. So I waited just a minute. Well, the dogs kind of cleared out and that bear just stepped out and stepped on the bluff where I couldn't see him and started rimming around. And I moved a little ways, and I knew that bear couldn't get out of there without me of getting another shot or two at him. And I looked down there while well, I could see that bear's foot sticking out, and I knew the way one of his hind feet, and I knew the way he, he was stretched out there, the way that foot stuck, stuck out there, that he was down. So... I finally got around there and got into a crack in this ledge and finally worked my way down to him. And uh, he was badly hurt, and he, but he could move his head a little bit. And I didn't want to break that skull because I knew it would measure big. So I went up close to him and I shot him right in the, right in the neck at the back of the head. And I made a mistake there because I busted off a little bit of the back of his skull, and that prevented him from being measured. But anyway, that killed him right there. <clears throat> then I got up there and hollered and hooped and yelled, and Clell answered me. And I told him, I said, come on down, because I've got this thing killed. And I finally found my dog, and he was tore up, but he is still alive, and he could travel on his own power. He was laying up there in the brush, and I brought him down there to the bar. And those other dogs chewed on him, but they was really leery about getting up to that bar till they knew that he was dead because he had really been charging him. Well, one of mine was gone, a blue tick female, and I figured that she'd just quit because she was uh, getting weaker all the time. But one of Clell's bulldogs was gone. And we that... That kind of bothered us because we was afraid that bear might have killed him. So we rolled him. Now we just bar this. This bear was the size we could just barely roll him off into this uh, little canyon to gut him. And so we rolled him off in there and gutted him. And then we heard Herschel and Sammy from way over on that other ridge of hollering, and uh, we. Find out, made them understand to come on 
that they could get across that that bar was dead. So that was on Herschel Downs cattle range, and of course he knew every every place you could go, and he knew a way across there, so they started to cross. And I told Clell, I said, well, now listen, you stay here at this bar and loan me your horse and let me go back and get my mule because it's a long ways there and it'll take me a while to get over there and get that mule and get back. And I got to get my shouts and my spurs and everything that I, I just throw down there in a big hurry and uh, you just wait here and when they come, uh, then when I get back, uh, we'll go on in and uh, we'll come. It's pretty cold weather. This bar will be all right and we'll prop him, prop him open with sticks and we'll come back and skin him in the morning and also pack him out. If We'll quarter him up and, and pack him out on a pack animal. So when I got back where well, they were there, so I, we finally got Rock, this red, big red dick hound. Now, I know, I know what this dog weighed. He is a good-sized dog, and I weighed him several times when he was in good shape and in good running shape. He weighed 68 pounds because I'd weighed him two or three different times. And then so we, he finally got to where he could travel without us uh, having to pack him, which would be better on him than us trying to carry him up and front of our saddles on a horse. So it, we had to wait on him quite a lot, but we finally got to the ranch house there and to Herschel's ranch, so we just put him, took him right in the kitchen and cleared all, all everything off the table and we laid that dog up on the table and Herschel went and got his uh, cocaine to shoot in the hide and kind of didn't it, and we sewed him up. Well, there was one place in him that we just liked just a little bit of going into the hollow of his stomach, and it must have been four inches across it, kind of a round circle. And we got him, but we got him sewed up, and within about three weeks to a month, well, he was a-hunting again, and it didn't affect him one bit on his nerve or running bar or anything. And that's when it's proven that if a dog's got the stuff in them and they get hurt and they get afraid of that animal, they haven't really got the stuff in them to make a, a dog that will run that animal good. And that never affected old Rock one bit. Well, now no telling how many times, I don't remember. But I imagine in a, a few year, years there that we had run this same bar at least 10 times and it never killed him. But we'd always had clients with us and was always trying to get the clients up to him and you just couldn't do that. And now that bear was mean. He had killed three dogs for us. Now we never did find that cross, that half bulldog, and, and uh, well now he was half bull terrier, not the pit bull, and half hound. And uh, then what? It was that just that first part of that fall. When Clell had moved on the mountain with his cattle and took his hounds, he had started out to exercise his dogs away, uh, away from the ranch. And he had a big red hound there that he called, uh, I believe he, he, he called him uh, Panther. And he was bad about starting bears, so he didn't take old Panther with him because when he hit a bear track, he couldn't hardly stop him. And so... After he'd been gone for a mile or two, uh, old Panther got a loose and trailed him up. Well, he went on and tried to make a circle, and they got after this bear. And he lost he lost them and, and never found them that day with the bear bait at all. And two of them never came back. So I came in just a day or so after this happened. And we went down there and looked for those dogs. Well, one morning, Clell was riding off in there to see if he could find them, and uh, he happened to glance down off of the trail that was going down a small canyon there that run into Grant Creek that run down and, and uh, come out right close to Clell's ranch on the river, which was about 12 miles down there. 
and he happened to glance down into this little canyon, and there laid old Scout. I mean, no, he called him uh, uh, Panther. There laid old Panther dead. And he went down there and looked at him, and he was all tore up, and the old and the dog was trying to get back. He wasn't an old dog, about five years old. He was trying to get back home, and he got so weak that he just fell off of that trail into that canyon and died. And we never did find the other one. But we just know that that line, uh, that that bear killed him because he had been in that country for a long time, and he knew it like a book. And if there hadn't have been something wrong, he'd have come. He'd have come out. He'd have come. He'd either went to the ranch on Blue River or he'd have come back out to the camp on top of the mountain. And then that half bulldog and half bull terrier that was on the bar when he was killed, we never did find him. And I went up there and looked for that dog for five days. And I would have somebody with me to lead my saddle animal. And I would trail these dogs in this bar. And now he was, here's the way he'd do it. And he was a mean bear. And he knew how. He would be a fighting them in them canyons, and then he'd start out. Well, naturally, most of them would be back behind him. And he'd go up just to climb out probably anywhere from 30 to 50 feet out of one of these little steep canyons. And then you could see where he just wheeled and just charged them right from back to the bottom. And... Uh, so he was a mean bear, but he come to the end of his ropes when we went down there to kill him and didn't have no clients with us, but it was a tussle to do it then. Well, now, people may frown on killing this stuff, but I want to tell you about that bear. Now, he had probably killed from five to $7,000 worth of livestock. It, it, because he had killed lots of, he killed lots of calves and yearlings, and uh, he had also killed. We knew those three dogs for us, and by gory, those dogs were worth a good chunk of money if you'd have been going to sell them, because they'd all sold for big, for big prices. And uh, once in a while, you'll find one of those renegade bears. And it's no telling how many times that we had run that bar. Well, now, that bar had been in there for a good many years. Now, there's a bar biologist down there that's been a tagging a bunch of bar for, well, he's been a working on those bar for eight years. And they've tagged a bunch of them and put them on radios on them and followed them all over the country and and studied them, and every one of those bar that they would snare, they would pull a little tooth out of his head. And uh, when they'd tranquilize him and age him, and one bar there, the age that they knew was, tell by looking at his teeth, that he was a real old bar, and that's the oldest one that they aged, and they aged all of them out of a hundred bar. And he was... 23 years old, so they will live to be pretty old. But I think that, as I remember, I think this owl account said that uh, a bear grew to and really got his growth and was a, a matured bear and probably is bigger, bigger than he'd ever get when he was somewhere around from seven to eight, nine years old, as I remember. That's what I heard him say one day. Well, this bar had been in there, I, as I can't remember just how many years, but he'd been in there killing stock for quite a few years. And he had been run by all kinds of packs of hounds besides ours. And I imagine that, I don't know, remember for sure, never kept track, but I imagine we had run that bar as many as 10 times and always had clients with us and tried to get them up to him, and you just couldn't do that. Well, now, that bar had been in there for a good many years. Now, there's a bar biologist down there 
that's been a tagging a bunch of bar for, well, he's been a working on those bar for eight years. And they've tagged a bunch of them and put them on radios on them and followed them all over the country and, and studied them. And every one of those bar that they would snare, they would pull a little tooth out of his head. And uh, when they'd tranquilize him and age him, and one bar there the age that they knew was tell by looking at his teeth that he was a real old bar, and that's the oldest one that they aged, and they aged all of them out of a hundred bar, and he was 23 years old, so they will live to be pretty old. But I think that, as I remember, I think this owl account said that uh, a bar grew to, and really got his growth and was a, a matured bar and probably is bigger, bigger than he'd ever get when he was somewhere around from seven to eight, nine years old, as I remember. That's what I heard him say one day. Well, this bar had been in there, I, as I can't remember just how many years, but he'd been in there killing stock for quite a few years. And he had been run by all kinds of packs of hounds besides ours. And I imagine that I don't know, remember for sure, never kept track, but I imagine we had run that bar as many as 10 times and always had clients with us and tried to get them up to him. And you just couldn't do that. Now, this is one of the biggest bar that we had ever caught. And, uh, out of a thousand and plus bars that we had caught. So, but one day I was talking to Ernest and we would, after our hunts, he, now he was the oldest one of the boys and I was the youngest. And, uh, it, he just liked 20 years of being, tw I mean, just a few months of being 20 years older than, than I was. My birthday was on the 27th of July, and his birthday was the 28th of November. And that's how much it liked for him being 20 years older than, than me. Well, he was always, of course, terribly interested, and after we'd make every hunt, we would get home while we'd spend lots of time visiting, and we would tell him about what each dog done and all about every race. That, that we that we could after we would come in from a hunt and what each dog done and all that and all we kept up with them dogs he knew all about them and uh, so we were talking about this bar after I came back to Tucson from up in the White Mountains and he said say said do you know how many bar that you and Clell have got for clients up in those White Mountains in the last ten years that you've been uh, taking out guide uh, hunters up there in the last 10 years. And I said, well, no, Ernest, I don't. I never kept track, and I have no idea. But I said, I do know that we've taken lots of bar up there. Well, he said, you know, I got out my records the other day, and I counted them up. And you boys have caught 250 bar in the last 10 years up there. And so that would average 25 bar a fall, and uh, our, and, uh, our f fall hunting wouldn't be over two months and a half a year. So we thought that was a pretty good record for taking bar continually for 10 years out of that country. But that was a bar country, and there are still lots of bar up in there. I know that I'm winding up my guiding career. I'm still a guiding some. And, uh, of course, I have a young hunter with me, and he does nearly all the work. And I just do the supervising, but uh, most of the time I go out with him. But if uh, it wears me down and I can't go or something, well, I've got him there to go out with the clients. And he is a, he's a good line and bear hunter, and he's a nice boy, and he's real polite. And he's a good hand, and he can cook good and do anything that's to be done. And uh, now, that, I was a little different to that. 
I was strictly a hunter and a and a hound man, and I didn't know but very little about mechanics doing anything to an automobile if it wouldn't run, and I knew very little about most everything except hunting and hounds, and that was my interest. And uh, I don't. I think it's kind of maybe a poor profession, but when I was growing up, that's what I picked. And folks, I'm proud of the fact that I went to the top of my profession, and I am, am known as one of the best hunters and guides for lion and bear and jaguar that ever hit the anywhere in the whole country. Well, now, folks, the satisfied customers and the amount of game that that uh, I have taken, of course, a lot of the time. I was with some of my brothers, and a lot of the time I wasn't. And I think that that proves that that is unquestionable to anybody. Well, I come through Tucson, and I don't remember exactly where I'd been. But anyway, I was going up north to hunt a few days. And then after I finished there, I was going to come back through Tucson, and... Uh, Stay there one night, and then I was going to the cherry cows to take out a lion hunting party from uh, Everett, Washington. And uh, then I was, and Cleo was going to meet me over there and help me with that party. Well, when I was going through to go north, this letter just came, I think, the day before from Burke's Gardens, Virginia. And this letter was from a Bowen Meeks, and he wrote and they wanted to buy a pack of hounds to catch what they called a varmint. Didn't any of them know what it was, so they called it a varmint. And this varmint had been a killing mostly sheep for about almost a year. And they claimed that it was taking away kind of the livelihood of a bunch of those farmers there. They called themselves ranchers. They would grow feed and uh, have sheep and cattle. So he said, well, what? If you got some dogs, you can sell them? I said, well, Ernest, how can I pick them a bunch of dogs to sell them to catch an animal that they don't know even what it is? And I said, it's a, good, it's a sense that we don't know what it is from 2,000 miles away. But I said, uh, you tell them that... Uh, if they will make it worth my while, I'll go back there and get it. I think. I don't care what it is. But I'm going to finish these hunts first. And that's when I was going north. And he wrote them that letter. So as I come back through then, in a few days, I don't remember. I think I was going a week or ten days. But I had a schedule I had to meet. And as I stopped going back through and stayed all night at home, Ernest and I lived right there close together. Well, I didn't even unload my stuff. I just unloaded my dogs, and that was all. And I was going to load up early the next morning and pull out for the cherry cows. And uh, it, by that time, he had a letter back. And they said, all right, says, uh, state your proposition. What will you come back here for and get that animal for us? So Ernest said, well, what do you... Think about it. You told him you'd come. I said, yeah, I will. But there hasn't been anything said about the price. No, he said, I know it hasn't. He said, what do you want to charge him? I said, well, write and tell him this is what I'll charge him. I'll go back there for $500 in my expenses, and I will spend as much as a month. And that is absolutely all expenses paid. All of my keep, all of the keep for my dogs, and all my tickets back and forth on me and the dogs. And if I get that animal farm, they're to give me 2500 and I'll come home. He said, well, I don't know whether they'll do that or not. I said, well, if they don't, I'm not going. I'm not interested. I said, that's the way that we're making our living. And if they want that animal bad enough, that's not anything like unreasonable. I said, I could charge them 5000 So he said, okay. He said, I'll let them know about it. 
and I just pulled on then for the cherry cows. And we got over there and got to really a hunt, lion hunting, and I think it was only the fourth day we was there or something like that, and we'd, we'd got one lion. We come in one afternoon, and there was a note was camped in an old ranch, and there was a note on the door from a, a boy that lived down at Portal, Arizona, which is six miles from there, the nearest telephone. And he said, uh, the first time you get a chance to come down to the telephone and call him, Ernest wants you to call him in Tucson. So the next day, well, we got in before too late, and I said, well, Clell, we better drive down to Portland and see what he wants. Because if he didn't want to talk to us, well, he wouldn't have sent that boy up there with with this with that note. And Cleo said, well, that's right. He said, well, let's run on down there. Well, we our clients was in there, and they'd been going pretty hard, and they were kind of tired, and they were resting, and we just got in the pickup and started down there. And uh, as we were riding along, I got thinking. I said, Cleo, I'll bet that's that varmint deal in Virginia that he's wanting to talk to us about. I said, well, now, if it is, if that is the deal, I said, why don't you go back, and I'll stay here and hunt lions. I said, listen, I've been over a lot of the world, and you haven't never been farther east than the Mississippi River, and that it would be a good trip for you, and it would be an experience. And he thought about it a little while, and he said, well, says if that's what it is, he said, I'll go. I said, all right. Well, when we called Ernest up, that's what it was. They had just either, I don't remember now whether they'd either wired him or they had uh, wrote him a letter. But anyway, well, they said, proposition accepted, come on. And I said, Ernest, did they send any money? He said, no, they didn't. I said, well, Ernest, the money talks, really. And that's what we're going back there for because we make, we make our living that way. So you tell them. You war them and tell them to war us some money. And just as soon as this hunt is over, well, Clell or I one will be on, be on the way. But we're not going to go until we get the money for some of our expenses or all of them. And you can war them and tell them that. And, uh, but neither one of us is a going until this hunt is over. And you can explain that to them because we're over there with these fellows are lion hunting, and we uh, told them we'd hunt with them so many days, and that's what we're going to do. N- nothing is going to keep us from it unless it's a death in the family or something. We're going to we're going to hunt till we finish. And he said, "All right." So we turned around and went on back. And let's see, the eighth day we got another good lion. And them fellas said, well, said, we're all excited about you boys' trip uh, back to Virginia after that varmint, and said, we're real interested in that, too. And we've hunted with you several times, and uh, we've got two good lines, so we're going to c- cut our hunt short for two days, and, uh, let, and we'll pull out in the morning. So... We did, and as we went by the telephone, we called Ernest and and said, "Say, Ernest, if they send any money, he said, "Yeah, he said they they wired. I believe he said they wired five hundred. So I said, "All right." I said, "Now listen." I said, "Clay and I both are coming on into to Tucson. Clay lived then at Tombstone, and I said he's uh, Clay's going to go because it'll be a." good trip for him and he has not never been back in that country and I have. I've been through there several times. And he'll see lots of country he's never seen and and uh, we both think we're capable. So Ernest said, all right, it don't make any difference which one of you goes. So we got back there and in just a day or so we got all everything together and Clell pulled out of there. Now he he took a bunch of traps with him, too. And uh, I don't remember, I think a couple of dozen. 
and he went on the train, and he took four hounds. And here's the way he figured it, and here's the way he picked them. He picked two dogs that were probably four and five years old that were trained. And he was afraid that maybe it was a wild dog or something like that. And then he picked two young ones that is about two and a half years old that were really running good, and we call them partly trained because they might run anything. And he figured that if uh, <clears throat> was something these older dogs didn't want to run, well, these two would. And he then he thought that he could get these other two by going along with them and hissing them and telling them to run it. He thought maybe he'd get these two older dogs from running it. So that was the way he picked his dogs. Now, he picked uh, an English-colored blue tick, I mean blue tick with kind of a blue tick body, and, and the red ticks run high on her head, and she had a tan head, and we called her Freckles, and she was a, she was a good hound. And then he picked another one, a big black and tan that he owned that wasn't of the black and tan breed, but he was that color and had no, he had some black and tan blood in him that was a big, tall hound, and he was pretty fast on the track and really had a booming, loud voice that you could hear a long ways, and he called him Runt. He was the runt of the litter for a while, but he grew up to be about the biggest dog in the litter. Then he had another English-colored blue tick that was blue tick on the back and with the red ticks running high and a and a tan head that was called Lightning Lee. And we we called him Lightning. And then he had a little red tick English female that he called Gypsy that was a good fast little hound and a good track dog. And that's the four that he took. So we took him down to Rodeo, New Mexico and put him on the train, not Rodeo, New Mexico, that was that down from Paradise. We was at Tucson then. We took him down to the railroad station in Tucson, and we put him on the train, and away he went. So then we wired those fellows at Birch Garden, Virginia, just when he would get into, into Bluefield, Virginia. Now, Bluefield, Virginia is right on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. In fact, the, the line runs right through the town and splits it. But there's more of it over in West Virginia than there is in Virginia. Well, he said when he got off of that train, they just flopped around there. And uh, all around him and those dogs, when the, they got the dogs out of the baggage cars, and the, two of these fellows are there with a, a nice pickup to meet him. Boy and Meeks and a friend of his. I met him later, but uh, I don't remember his name. And all right, they loaded up, and away they went to Birch Garden, Virginia. Well, he got there about noon one day, and it didn't take them long. I think, as I remember, uh, Birch Gardens was about 50, 75 miles from Bluefield. Good road, and it didn't take them too long to get there. So after they got there, well, he said it was quite something. He said they got to rowing amongst themselves. Who was going to keep him? See, they were to keep one of us and, and feed us and our dogs and all that. That was amongst us, along with the expenses. And so one fellow said, well, says, I'll keep you a week. And another one said, well, I'll keep you a week. And they finally got around to where each one is going to keep him for a week out of the out of the month that he was that he w would stay until or, or until he got the animal and this really did make this boy and meat mad of course he's been there right all of his life and right there amongst boys that his men of his age that he'd been raised with and then of course he knew all the younger ones that was growing up and he really got mad. He said, listen, he said, I think, and I'm ashamed of it. He said, I think this Burke's Garden's outfit 
these ranchers here are the cheapest bunch that I've ever heard of. Well, he says, I haven't got any sheep left. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because that varmint had killed so many of my sheep that I sold the rest of them to keep from losing them all and not getting anything out of any of them. So we'll just take him to my place and I'll keep him. So they went on to Bo and Mix's ranch and uh, <clears throat> quite a gang of them. I think there's 10 or 15 of those ranchers went with them. And when they got to Bo and Mix's ranch, well, they pulled out this track that they had dug out of the kind of little snow and slush and put it in the deep freeze. Well, they went and got this track and showed it to him, and he said, well, he said, that's kind of whomper jawed around a little, and it's hard to tell just what it is from looking at that, but I think I know what it is, but I want to know for sure before I tell you fellas what that track is. And do you reckon we could find the tra tracks of that animal around here close? Well, they said he's arranging right in here, so they walked up on a ridge there, and after a bit, well, they came to a kind of an opening and uh, kind of through the mud, and then there was a little dirt there that he's making tracks in, and Clell followed the tracks a long ways and looked at them good, and then turns around to these fellows and says, well, that's a coyote. And one of them says, well, it can't be. He says, we haven't had a coyote here for 50 years. Clell says, yes, you have. You got one here now, and he's not very far off. And that fellow said, well, I'd bet $50 that that's not a coyote. Well, now, Clell's a little, turned a little different to me. He didn't say anything. It's a good thing it wasn't me, because if it had been, I'd have said, mister, you're called. I'll take that $50. So they just saved $50 on the deal because it's fell instead of me. But anyway, well, this boy in Meek says, listen, says, I'm going to call out a coyote until it's proved otherwise because he's the only man that's ever been here and saw those tracks and all and could tell us what it was. And I believe that's what it is. <clears throat> well, now, that was, a, I guess, a Wednesday. Well, Thursday, a bunch of them got out and went to looking around, and about noon, they found some fresh tracks of this coyote. So they took the dogs up to the tracks and took them up there on leashes. And the way he got them to do it, he got to showing those younger dogs that track and letting them smell of it, and they got to run on the leashes and the bawling and the wanting to go, and he turned them loose, and away they went. Well, then he turned his older dogs loose and run along with them and hissed them and telling them that he wanted them to catch that animal, and they got started, and away they went. Well, they pushed that thing then and jumped it in a little ways, and they pushed that coyote for four hours. Well, now, this Burke's Gardens is kind of a valley, and around it is, is small mountains kind of like the Ozarks, a little bit like the Ozarks here in Arkansas. But anyway, well, it, they, the fellow that was with him was a young guy about 18, 20 years old. And the reason he picked him, they said that's the best shot in, that, in this country and he's the biggest poacher. But says they, he poaches all the time, but they can't catch him. And everybody knew it. So he took him with him. Well, his name was uh, Jones, and at about four o'clock that e evening, here they come, coming through a, a saddle on a, a ridge that they is on up there. And Clell told him, said, come on, uh, I think his name was Manford Jones, says, come on, Manford, let's jump behind this tree and we'll kill that thing right here. Well, there was a dirt bank, cut dirt bank right there. And this Jones thought he's going to come under that dirt bank, so he run over there and looked over, and he turned the coyote back. And when he did, Clell just run down there and grabbed his dogs and put leashes on them. He says, I'm not going to let these dogs run here in the night, because they had that valley literally strong with poison. Poison was everywhere. 
And he figured if he lost them at night, well, they had an awful good chance of getting poisoned. So the, the coyote went right on down and passed by two fellows that they had put on stands, and they missed him seven shots. And so they went on back to boring meats. Well, that was a, a Thursday. Well, Thursday night it started storming. And it stormed Thursday night and Friday and Friday night and Saturday and late in the afternoon Saturday, well, it cleared up. And all right, the next day was Sunday. And uh, they wouldn't hunt or do anything on Sunday. But go to, well, well, the, the farm that belongs to them, they don't want to do anything on Sunday, well, I'll go to church with them. And so just at daylight Sunday morning, the telephone rang. And this fellow was named Davis, and he wanted to talk to Clell. So Clell talked to him, and he said, uh, Say, says that coyote jumped over my fence and came right in to the barn door that was open while I had my sheep bedded down, and says he killed one of my prize rams and kind of drug him out to the fence a little right short distance and ate a little on him and jumped the fence. And Clell turned around and and said, listen, Mr. Meeks, says that coyote just killed one of Davis's prize lambs. Now this is Sunday morning. Now what are we going to do? So he said, boy and Meeks stood there and kind of bowed his head and looked at the floor a while and then raised up and looked at Clell and he said, listen, says that animal is a taking away the livelihood of some of the Birch Garden r ranchers. And I think the good Lord would overlook it if we would try to get that animal today. Clell says, well, that's all I want to know. So he just stood right there at that telephone and telephoned a bunch of people to be there and be there quick. Around there and in just a little while, well, he said he had to, in just a few minutes, probably 30 minutes, maybe 45, he had about 100, better than 100 people there. So he just scattered them out on stands. Well, this uh, Manford Jones that had been with him the day before had a bad cold and didn't feel very good. So right down across the this kind of valley was a family graveyard. So he put Manford Jones and another fellow in there that I've forgotten his name, but I did meet him uh, in this family graveyard in the there was a, a wall built up around it. I think they used rocks. About somewhere around three feet high. And they got in there. And Clell went to that ranch and put the dogs on the trail right where that coyote jumped the fence. And it it was fresh and they just left there. Well, they run down on a real wooded point and instead of that coyote trying to double back, well, he just took right out straight across this valley. And Pell was running in front of the hounds and said he could see the hounds and the coyote. And they were really, all of them really a running. And he said he run right straight towards that graveyard. And when they got, when the coyote went to getting up pretty close, he's, he's, he'd see these guys stick their heads up and then duck back down. Well, he figured that when the coyote was about 60 yards from there, well, they raised up and they went to shooting. This man for Jones had a 22 Hornet and the other fellow had a shotgun with buckshot. Well, Clell said every time that that 22 Hornet went off, well, that coyote rolled. And he hit him and rolled him the first shot. But he'd keep jumping up. And he had to shoot him three times to keep him down. <clears throat> And then after that, these fellows kind of uh, really got mad at one another because each one of them said they killed the coyote. Clell went right on just as fast as he could to the coyote, and there's a whole gang there by the time he got there. And he said they were up there uh, pulling the hair out of him for souvenirs. And one of them knocked out a, a tush, a canine tush out of his mouth, and another one cut off 
a toe with a claw on it. And when he, he got there and he made them get back and wouldn't let them, anybody get up to that coyote. And this Jones is one of them that had got the claw. And Cleo turned around and pretty well knew who done it and asked this boy what happened to his toe. Well, he says, I guess it was off. Well, Cleo said, yeah, somebody cut it off with a knife. But anyway, then they took this coyote and they gutted him and it was cold weather. So they finally took it down to Tazewell, which was just a few miles. It was the county seat of Tazewell County. And this was in Tazewell County, Virginia. And they hung him right up in front of the courthouse and bedded the, these dogs down in a real warm barn right there close so they'd be warm because it was pretty cold weather and damp. And they counted these people. And in three days, there was 7,500 people come to see that vicious varmint and those hounds. So then Cleo skinned the coyote, prepared it and all, and they had it mounted life size, and they gave it to Bowen Meek. And I don't know whether his, he's dead now, and I don't know whether his folks still got the that mounted coyote or not, but uh, that was quite a deal. Cleo said that he had to shake so many hands, it was kind of like shake being a president because they just stream in there and line up to get to shake his hand. So then they wanted, all them ranchers in wanted him to come and stay with them and and uh, have them entertain him and all that. And he says, no, I don't think I'll do that. He says, I'm going back and stay with Bo and Meeks until I get my money. Now what really happened the board of supervisors appropriated that money. So he had to stay there a few days while it went through all the legal process and all to get, uh, to get his money. So they they paid him his money and all of the expenses and he put his dogs on the train and came back and we picked him up in Tucson. And that's the Birch Gardens Virginia Coyote and that's the most noted animal that any of the Lee brothers ever called.